We're on the road again, and our story for this program begins here at the Wells Fargo Museum. Hi, I'm Peter Robinson. This program is looking at the world of stagecoaches. Uh, behind me is a typical Concord stagecoach. It's the type that would have been in use in the second half of the 19th century, and in fact, was running way up to 1918. Inside, it would carry nine passengers, uh, but you could also put another nine on top, and then at the front was the stagecoach driver, known as the whip, and the shotgun driver who kept off the bandits. Now, in fact, we began with a sequence of stagecoach chases in that early opening sequence. But in real life, uh, these stagecoaches traveled at six miles an hour, uh, which meant that a horseman would soon outrun them. They would stop approximately every 60 miles, change horses, and of course, there would be water and hay. A typical coach was pulled by six horses, but could be pulled by four. Now, behind me is a box, and this is known as the Wells Fargo box, and it was the box that the bandit or the highwayman would finally make, give the instruction, throw down the box. And Wells Fargo put the passengers' lives first, so in fact they did throw down the box. The stagecoach is also an interesting part of American cultural history, since it's that bridge between the Pony Express and eventually when steam power took over the locomotive or the train. Today we're going to be talking to Karen Kandazian, author of The Whip, and hers is a story of a very unusual stagecoach driver, The Whip. Her name, Charlie Parkhurst. I emphasize the word her because Charlie spent her life dressed as a man. In fact, she chewed tobacco, she smoked cigars, she swore like a trooper, and eventually in 1879 would die of throat and tongue cancer. She probably was the first woman to vote for General Grant. That's voting, of course, as a man. And like General Grant, he too chewed tobacco, smoked cigars, and sadly he too died of tongue and throat cancer. Wells Fargo, in fact, had 132 stopping stations between Nebraska and California. But if we take a typical California route, it would actually begin in Yuma, work its way towards San Diego, and then up the coast to San Francisco. Now, from San Francisco to Sacramento in those days, it was actually quicker to go by riverboat. Uh, but of course, there were also the typical stagecoach routes. Well, Karen, it's nice to be inside the stagecoach as opposed to on top where Charlie Parkhurst would have been. And I guess my first question is, uh, how did you get involved in writing the story of this remarkable woman? When I was a girl, um, I can't believe I used to read Cosmopolitan magazine, How to Catch a Man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in one of the issues, there was this fascinating article about I think it was called Wild Women of the West, or Wild Outlaws, Women Outlaws of the West. Um, and there was this article about Charlie Parker's. And I have no idea, but I was so fascinated that a woman could carry off this disguise for so many years mm -hmm. that no, nobody caught her. I mean, I was thinking to myself, how in the world did she pee on the trail? How did she have a period? How did she, you know, cover herself in a way that uh, disguised a body, is what I'm saying. And it, I used to think about it, and I thought, I'd love to write something about her someday. And so, about in the middle of the 90s, I wrote a screenplay. Not mm -hmm. a very good one, but it got optioned. It, uh, William Morris took it on, and it got optioned by a Canadian producer named Kevin Sullivan, mm -hmm. and um, at that time there was no cable, and he tried to get it on network television well. Cross-dressing on CBS, I think, was not quite uh, what they were looking for, so uh, it was passed on. And then a girlfriend of mine said, why don't you write a novel? 
I thought a novel. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. So I would think about it. I would think about it. I started reading books on novel writing, and um, I took a class or two, and I started taking my yellow legal pad and making notes. And and all of a sudden, my my mama passed away in oh five. I'm going to now use that energy, use those feelings, and start writing something. And so. I and did. so the book took and shape. So I began the book. Six right. years later, it took six years, 27 drafts to complete. But, um, and um, I hope my mom knows. I dedicated the book to my mom and my dad. Uh, when it comes to writing, I know you've had a rich career on the stage. I know you played Maria Callas in Masterclass. So I guess, uh, what help did you actually get from being an actor uh, to becoming not the reciter of words, but the creator of words. You know, I have this theory after finishing the book that, that actors, if they have the stamina to do it, and also uh, have the passion, would be the best writers. Because what we do is we backstory, we, that's what it's all about. We, we, um, we put our minds into what would the character be doing right now? How would they be reacting? How, how are they different than me? How are they the same as me? Um, uh, we're taught in acting classes to, to improvise. Mm -hmm. And so if you give me a situation, um, we have to improvise around it. And that's exactly what doing a chapter or a book is. It's improvising a character in a situation. Um, so the, the, the acting helped a lot. And the other thing was, there's something called sense memory in acting, mm -hmm. particularly in the method. Uh, Lee Strasberg was my teacher, and that's one of the things I learned. And what that is, is if you hear a certain tune, or a taste, or smell, um, it brings up a feeling in you. Mm -hmm. And as an actor, that's how you create the emotion. But as a writer, I found that I would do that to myself. So it was the same type of motivation. Yes. Right. So for instance, like if there was a very difficult, sad, uh, lost place, I would bring up the picture of my mama's face as she was passing away. Mm -hmm. and, and it would bring up feelings, and it would almost write itself. Mm -hmm. Now, when you speak about writing itself, we're dealing with the 19th century. We're dealing with a tough period in terms of language. In fact, this has got something of the language of Deadwood. So how did you go about finding those particular words, the ones we can't the speak about? Words. The curse words, oh, yes. Oh, all those juicy words. <laughs> well, actually, uh, when I was a kid, uh, eight, nine years old, my mama's brother, Whoa, he had a mouth. And, you know, at first I didn't know what he was saying, and I would ask my cousins, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And they would tell me, and then they'd make me say it. You know, and I was so shy. So just to say the word hell or damn was like a big deal for me. Yeah, but this book goes even further oh, than that. Oh my God, yes. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I even used the N word in it. Mm -hmm. Because the N word was a natural word that people used then. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a slur, right. right? Unless you said it in a slurring way to mm -hmm. someone, it was just a, like we say African American. It mm -hmm. was as simple as that. And then there were the swear words because she did swear like a trooper. Yes, and of course she had to swear more than the men did, in to to keep the guys going. Mm -hmm. You know, and she was apparently had an incredibly foul mouth. Mm -hmm. She could outdo most of the men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think too that the book, although it's set in the 1850s until the time of her death, 1879, has got a story about contemporary feminism. Yes. And I'm sure that must have been on your mind. Yes. Um, actually, it, it interested me only in that I never realized how many women in that period mm -hmm. lived their lives as men until I did the research. Mm -hmm. And because you had two choices then, well, maybe three, to be a, a, a 
wife or a prostitute, and if you had uh, some education, you could teach. And if your husband passed away and left you a house, you could be a, you know, you could rent a rooms, mm -hmm. a boarding house. That was it. Mm -hmm. So those women who were free-spirited people, like me, who had a sense of adventure, mm -hmm. you know, they put on bridges. Right. And there was a woman, uh, my goodness, there's been so many people that I've found. Um, a famous woman who was a, a, a soldier in the Confederate Army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And nobody caught her. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then she went home and had three children. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and of course it's a story of, um, love is a story of revenge. And it's a story which, as you go across these dusty trails, I, I can see visually working as a movie. So I'm just wondering, uh, had you given any thought if the whip as a book could then be turned into a movie? Oh, it would be lovely. Um, you know, a any author has their dream. Should I tell you what my dream is? Oh, yes, go, okay. go. My yeah. dream is, uh, it's a dream, but that Clint Eastwood would produce it, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Catherine Bigelow, the, the woman who just won the Academy Award for directing a couple of years ago yeah. for Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker, because which is a very tough film set in Iraq yes. about a bomb disposal squad. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. But she did it so poetically, the violence. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, there's a lot of violence in my book for a reason. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, she has that sense of poetry with violence, which would be wonderful and understands, of course, she's a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and then for Charlie, uh, Charlize Theron would be wonderful. And so would Kate Winslet. Mm -hmm. You know, Kate Winslet loves to gain weight, and she could be stocky and strong, you know, and Charlize Theron can do anything. They're both very brave actors. Mm -hmm. You have to have brave women doing mm -hmm. this because mm -hmm. um, y you have to make yourself ugly. Mm -hmm. She's a, as free-spirited as you can get. Mm -hmm. Only everyone thinks she's a man. In fact, they did not know that she was a woman. Mm -hmm. until they got her ready for her funeral. Right. And, all, right. and suddenly all the doctors in town had to come and they, they, they couldn't believe it, that this person, 30 years, had, one of the most famous California stagecoach drivers was a woman who had had a child. Mm -hmm. Now I've been thinking about this because I know you've been on a, a book tour, you're going to be in Marin next week, um, but also you may be at some schools and colleges. So. If you wanted to encourage a young person to write, uh, what would you say to them? I would say, the thing about writing is so wonderful, is you can tell all your secrets. Mm -hmm. I guess like every writer, there must be some other book lurking down there which perhaps is about to hit the page. So what's happening to you next? I would like to write a fictionalized memoir. Uh -huh. Because I've had a very bizarre, crazy, wild life and I, I should have been dead several times mm -hmm. and I've been protected mm -hmm. and I want very much to share with people how I believe that everything in our life mm -hmm. is a gift. Mm -hmm. You actually came up with uh, looking for Jack Kerouac. Yes, and, and do you know why? Jackie, no. Looking for Jack Kerouac is because when I was 13 years old in San Francisco, I had long hair and I carried my guitar and, and I, we used to go to the uh, City Lights bookstore all the time because I was in love with Jack Kerouac on mm -hmm. the road. Mm -hmm. And they all would always say to me, oh, you know, he's over there across the street. So I'd go across the street and they'd say, no, no, he's at that restaurant there. Well, it seemed like all my life I was looking for Jack Kerouac. Mm -hmm. And my whole life has been like that, looking for certain things, thinking I wanted it, I needed it, and I didn't get it, and I was protected because I didn't get it. Well, thank you again, Karen, for being with us. Uh, the book, The Whip, the story of Charlie Parkhurst, and what a fun ride. And I think with that, let's hit the trail. <laughs> Okay. Ooh, you could get seasoned in this. <laughs> what was it Mark Twain said? It was like being rocked in a cradle? Rocked in a cradle. <laughs> Our story finishes up here in the upstairs room of the Wells Fargo Museum.
And this is just a wonderful place to visit if you're in San Francisco. Memorabilia, a slice of banking history, and of course, wonderful information about the role stagecoaches played in the moving frontier, all part of America's manifest destiny. I'm standing next to Black Barr, who I call the gentleman highwayman. In fact, he never rode a horse. He always carried an unloaded shotgun and, over a spread of eight years, robbed 28 coaches before being captured and eventually ending up in jail. See you on the road again. This is Peter Robinson with one simple message. Keep reading.